dear sons and daughters of the Lord. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for making us your children, for blessing us with the promise of salvation through your Son, Christ Jesus, who has delivered us from sin, death, and the devil, who leads us each day, so that one day we might be with you forever. Lord, strengthen us in our faith, that we may ever trust in you and know that you are our loving Heavenly Father. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Today, in our epistle lesson from Romans chapter 8, Paul uses that image of God, which is an image that, well, even for those outside the church, is one they can identify with. He refers to God as the Father. Now, there are plenty of other images in Scripture that he could use. God is righteous. He is just. He is a judge. He is king. He is Lord over all. Creator of the universe. But Paul uses the image of God the Father. God the Father is meant to be an image that is meant to bring comfort, to remind us of His compassion for us, His love for us, His graciousness for us. That image of God as Father is meant to remind us that He cares for us. Not only did He create this world around us, but continues to sustain it. And for many of us, this image is a powerful image. Because maybe for you, you remember your father, the father he was to you. Maybe you remember the times that you were a father, a father to your children. Or maybe you can remember a grandfather who would scoop you up and pick you up on and put you on his lap and tell you stories. Oftentimes, that image of father, it brings us a sense of peace and God's compassion. But that's not true for everyone, is it? Not everyone who reads those words, God, our Father, finds the same comfort in those words. Not everyone who thinks of God as Father is comforted because not everybody on this side of eternity had a perfect Father. In fact, not one of us had a perfect Father. And for some of you, I know that your fathers, when you think of them, you don't get a positive response. Maybe when you hear that word, our Father, you you cringe instead. When you think about a father who is an author, authoritarian, who you, no matter how hard you tried, you could never live up to his standard. Maybe when you think of your father, maybe you think of a father who, maybe he was physically there, but emotionally unavailable. You didn't know what you could talk to him about. You never knew what words could say, you could say if he would even hear you. Some of you, you maybe know someone who's a fa- who has a father who left their mother, who, le- who abandoned you. Some of you never knew your fathers. And when you hear that, our father... Maybe your first response isn't compassion, isn't hope and comfort. Maybe you don't immediately think about a father who was willing to do everything for you, to send his very own son for you. But that's why when we look at our Heavenly Father, even with the experience of our earthly fathers, we know that He is our perfect Father. That He is our Father who has called us His children. That He is our Father who has called you son, who has called you daughter, and who shows you greater love than you could ever imagine or deserve. Because when we think about it, when we think about what we deserve, when we think about the way our Father should treat us, well, what do we deserve? Not the gracious love He shows us, is it? But that's exactly what our perfect Heavenly Father shows us. And that's what Paul is trying to remind us that church in Rome of. That's what Paul is attempting to remind us of today. It's whose we are as the children of God. Who our Father is as we call God our Heavenly Father and we are His sons and daughters. Paul is attempting to remind us that we are those children. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer separated from God by our sin. But Jesus as our Deliverer has broken down every barrier. Jesus as our Lord has made a way for us to come to our Father in Heaven. 
to sit at his table to receive his good gifts and his blessings. Our Father, who loves us and embraces us. And I'd like you to, for just a moment, think about two instances in life. Baptism and death. Because in those two instances, there's something that's hidden away in the liturgy that many times we'll read right over, that it's part of it, but maybe you've gotten comfortable with. In those places in the liturgy, the congregation together prays the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. We pray those words, and at that very same time, at a baptism, the pastor, I get the opportunity to lay my hands upon the child. The same is true at death, at the commendation of the dying. Again, I lay my hands upon that person. And whether you're an infant who could not pray the Lord's Prayer, whether you were unconscious, a person who's unconscious and dying, those are the words of our speech, our prayer to our Lord. The Lord's Prayer, which Jesus has given us to pray to our Father, are those words that even in a person who's unconscious or a baby who can't speak, those are their speech, those are their commitments of faith. Those are the words that the Spirit gives to us and that we pray together as a congregation. It's important we remember that prayer, that prayer that we pray to our Father because it is the words that Jesus has given to us, words to address Abba, our Father. So often in church, we go through it, rote memory. We pray that prayer. We know it's coming up right before communion, right after the prayer, right after the prayers at church, and we'll be done with it within a minute. I encourage you to think about that prayer. Think about what it means to call upon your Father, my Father. Think about it, what it means to be called an heir of God's kingdom, to come to Him, to actually lift up your voice to Him, knowing His love, His compassion for you. That promise that He's always there for you. Think about it as we pray today. That you do not pray with only your voice, but you pray with the Spirit. We pray together as the Lord has taught us through the voice of the Spirit. Go again to Romans 8 with me, to just the end of our reading for today. Listen to the words that Paul says. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We pray not of our own, but of the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's guidance. We pray to our Father knowing that it is not merely our words, but the Spirit speaking through us, that even as sinners, we can come to a loving Father. And Jesus also included two, three words right after that. Thy kingdom come. Because as we pray that prayer, to our Lord, as we pray that prayer, we know what it, we know the promise that we are going to be heirs, not only of His kingdom here on earth, as He moves and breathes and as He works through us here on earth, but we are going to be king, heirs of His heavenly kingdom. We have the promise that we are not merely going to be those who are on the outside, at arm's reach, but we are going to be with Him. We have that promise that we are going to be heirs. Sometimes, though, sometimes we lose sight of this. And that's why it's so important we remi we're reminded of what it means to be heirs of God's kingdom. Because in this world that we live in, we see a lot of things that sparkle. We see a lot of things that are glittery, that are bright and shiny, that are beautiful and nice, and they seem like they must be wonderful and great. Open any magazine, click on any web page, flip through any channel. And you'll get an advertisement, and it splashes out at you. You cannot help but draw your attention in, partially because if you uh, turn on the TV, the volume is about twice as loud. But as you're watching it, as you read it, as you look at it, you realize there's these things out there that make God's kingdom seem awful dull, plain, simple. Who would want God's kingdom when you can have the most amazing body? made by this pill or that pill which will change you 
Who would want the, shi- the dull kingdom of God when you have a shiny brand new car, brand new TV, new cell phone that can do every function under the sun just by your voice? Where's the light of God's kingdom amidst the bright shininess of the American dream? To live for ourselves. To become rich, powerful, famous. To take care of ourselves. To put ourselves first. To comfort ourselves. To enjoy the many things we feel we deserve. It's the things of this world. They shine brightly, don't they? But I remind you that the things of this world, they will pass away. Not one kingdom has lasted forever. Kingdoms have risen and kingdoms have fallen. Fortunes have grown and fortunes have disappeared. Even in your own lifetime, how many of us have watched as people at one time who had great fortunes, great influence, have fallen? For us, our houses, they need repairs. Our cars, they break down. Silver and gold, they tarnish. These things of this world that are shiny and glittery at first, seemingly so beautiful, they pass away. And that's why when we turn to our faith as children, as heirs of God our Father, we realize it is something that will never pass away. That promised kingdom that God offers to us is a promise that will never pass, no matter if all else passes away in this world. We have that promised hope. We have that guarantee. The guarantee that we'll be with Him forever. The guarantee that He will provide for us. Because when we think about God our Father, we're reminded that it is not only those things that promise of eternity, but it is the way He cares for us on this earth. The way He provides for that which we need. The way He works through others. Maybe even some of you to serve your neighbor, your spouse, or your children. See, God's kingdom, it's not flashy. It's not glittery glittery or sparkly. But it is His presence with us. It is His promise that He will be with us throughout all our lives. It is His promise that He will be with us whether things are going well or whether we're suffering. And we can almost count on the suffering portion, can't we? Because we do live in a sinful world. A world that has been broken by our sins. We're reminded of Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 16. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. No. Although we'll have that presence of God with us, it doesn't make things perfect. It doesn't make the, mean that life will be easy. But it does mean we have a Heavenly Father who is with us through all things. We have a Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us, who embraces us in ways that we cannot ever imagine, who takes care of the needs that we haven't even thought of yet, who walks with us in the paths that are difficult, who walks with us in the paths that are easy. We have a Heavenly Father who is preparing us, whether it be at our baptism or whether it be our last day on this earth to spend eternity with Him. Because that's what it means to call Him our Father. To know that His kingdom will come. That as we pray that prayer, as we think about what it means to be the children of God, we know that He sends His Spirit each and every day to be with us, to guide us, and to direct us to walk with us. And we're reminded, again, of those words of Paul. And let's go to those last two verses. And if you... If you have your bulletin right in front of you, I encourage you to read those with me because it is that reminder, that promise that God has given us. We are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We will be glorified with our Father in Heaven as we call Him Abba, Father. May you know the promise of our Lord that He loves you, He cares for you, He forgives you, He leads you and guides you, 
that one day you may be with him forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, our Heavenly Father, forgive us for those times when the things of this world seem to draw us away, distracting us from you, dividing our attention from your love and your mercy. Forgive us for those times when we seek after the things of this world, the things that seem to glitter and seem to gleam, but those things will fade. Forgive us and reassure us that because you have sent your Son, Christ Jesus, that you do indeed deliver us, that he has indeed delivered us from each of our sins, so that we can come to you, so that we can come to you with our prayers and our petitions, so that we can come to you in every need and every joy of our lives. Lord, help us each day to pray that prayer you have taught us, calling upon you as our Father, knowing that you are the one who loves and cares for us, and even now prepares a place for us at the table, that we might join with you in life eternal. May this be our strength. May this be our hope, this day and in all days. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds, Amen.